I'd like to thank Mosaic Leeds for their collaboration on this event and particularly Father Mike Green for facilitating it all and both our speakers as well. Professor Elizabeth Stewart, in what she has to say, reminds me of the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus in John's Gospel, where Jesus says, the Spirit blows where she wills. And it seems to me that sometimes we need to be awake to the fact that the Spirit of God moves, not just within the confines of the church, but much more widely. And a lot of the time we have a great deal of catching up to do. So thank you, and uh, let's, uh, let's hear what Professor Elizabeth has to say. Thank you so much for this invitation to speak to you. I must admit that when I got the invitation, I found myself groaning inwardly a little. I've been involved in discussions and debates about inclusivity in the church, particularly in relation to LGBTQ plus people, for 30 years and I'm tired, as I'm sure some of you are. It reminded me of the Gospel from a couple of Sundays ago uh, when Jesus heals a man who is deaf and has a speech impediment of some sort. Just before he heals the man, Jesus looks up to heaven and he sighs deeply or groans. The word stenazo can mean either of those things. That's a curious detail in that story. Why does Jesus groan? Is he groaning out of compassion for the man or is he exhausted? Well, perhaps the key lies in the word that's used to describe the man's problem with his speech. It's the word mogilalos. It's a very rare word in scripture. The only other place it's found is in Isaiah 35, 6 in, in the Greek translation where where Isaiah envisages a time when the lame will leap like deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Perhaps Jesus groans because he realises that that time envisaged by Isaiah has arrived and he is responsible for it. Or it ha perhaps it has something to do with the story uh, before this one which is the story of the Syrophoenician woman. More of that in a moment. Whatever, Jesus appears to groan because bringing in the kingdom of God is hard work. St Paul uses that word, stenazo, to groan or sigh deeply at various points, including in Romans 8 when he talks of creation groaning in labour pains, and says that we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. And indeed he adds that the Spirit itself intercedes for us with sighs or groans too deep for words. Our exhausted groaning is a prayer and it's the prayer of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. It's the prayer thy kingdom come. The kingdom is still in the process of being realised. The church, which is its sacrament, is still in the process of being born. We are still in the process of being adopted. None of us actually knows the true and final shape of the kingdom of God or the church. And I think we all struggle with a future that is that open, over which we have no control. And the temptation is always to try and foreclose it, to lift the drawbridge to try to keep it contained and manageable. But that's never going to happen because the Holy Spirit is feral and the Kingdom of God is going to come. This brings me back to the Syrophoenician woman. In Mark's Gospel, the story of the Syrophoenician woman 
follows an encounter between Jesus and the Pharisees over his disciples' attitude to purity laws and customs. Now, I have never had more of an understanding of purity cultures than I do now, having lived thus far through COVID. Suddenly, for all of us, other people and their bodies became a threat. And they threatened chaos and death. And our reaction was to police our boundaries and borders, the borders of our bodies, of our communities, our national borders, our international borders. And having experienced that, I think I understand afresh the terrifying radicalness of Jesus' teaching. The kingdom of God is a community which is completely undefended. It has no boundaries, no borders, and is unconcerned about its own survival. And if the kingdom of God is an undefended community, the church must be so as well. As Michael Jenkins has noted, ironically, the church is most attractive when it pursues its vocation unconcerned with its own survival. The story of the Syrophoenician woman is a story of an encounter that produces movement from a defended to an undefended position. She shows, and Jesus allows her to show, where his teaching leads. And it leads across the borders between the lost sheep of the house of Israel and everyone else. Perhaps his subsequent groan is the groan of acknowledgement that she's right but also the groan of realising where that undefended position will lead him personally, which of course is to the border between life and death. Not being afraid to die, being unconcerned about one's own survival, means not being afraid to make mistakes. Fear contracts the heart, fearlessness opens the heart. And this is why, of course, the message of angels often begins with, do not be afraid. Because you need to have an open heart in order to hear the message that the angel wants to impart. If you're not afraid to make mistakes and have an open heart, if you're not concerned about your own survival, you can afford to be generous, hospitable and abundant. Think of the parable of the sower. That sower isn't afraid to make mistakes. They throw that seed all over the shop. And if that's a parable about God's grace, then what Father Gerald Robinson Brown calls the famine of grace in the contemporary church is truly scandalous. Only if the church is undefended, fearless, open-hearted and unconcerned with its own survival Will it be what Eugene Schlesinger calls the union of enemies? A community committed to holding on to one another, even if some think others are in error. And we need to be such a community because we are not God. We know that we are in process we know that we are on a pilgrimage towards the kingdom of God and we have not arrived there yet. We do not know its 
final shape, its true shape. We do not know our own final, true shape. Humility requires the church to be a union of enemies, equal enemies. And that's the hard edge of inclusivity and diversity, that we make space for those with whom we profoundly disagree. Not just at the edges, but at the set but at the centre, not just in part, but fully. That binary between friend and enemy is, is dissolved at the resurrection, along with the binary divide between life and death, and a whole host of other identities which are rendered non-ultimate, in the new creation that emerges from the womb of the tomb, including, I would want to say, gender identities. But also, crucially, there's no binary divide between the church and the world. If the famous definition of mission as finding out what God is doing in the world and joining in is correct, then the boundaries between the church and the world must be porous. Indeed, as Pope Francis has noted, the church must always be in departure, always limping after the untamable and uncatchable spirit of God as she dances through creation. Perhaps then we should not be surprised that we usually arrive late at what God is doing in the world. But sometimes our arrival is unconscionably late and our resistance to joining in what God is doing, evidence of a community concerned more about its own survival than witnessing to the blazing glory of God's abundant grace. The more I reflect on the creation narratives, the more I think that if there is an original sin, it is thinking the worst of God. The man and the woman hide because they do not believe that God will forgive their mistake. They think the worst of him. And from that it is but a small step to think the worst of each other. I think that what we need to be mindful of is that what we are groaning for is not a community in which everyone agrees, in which there's no friction or fighting. Church has never been that and it never will be that. What we're groaning for, I think, is a community which is undefended, fearless, humble, porous, unconcerned with its own survival, and therefore prepared to make mistakes because it believes the best of a forgiving and graceful God. That is a church which will be inclusive, which will glory in diversity and difference. And that, I believe, is a church worth groaning for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Elizabeth Stewart. There's lots there for us to think about. And while we're thinking about it, Let's listen to our next talk given by Dr. Robin Henderson Espinoza, a prominent theologian from the United States, talking about difference and how difference affects our lives and our theology. Hi folks, I'm Dr. Robin Henderson Espinoza and my affirming pronouns 
are they and them? I'm coming from uh, the my home, which is in Nashville, Tennessee, the United States, so across the pond from y'all. And this is land that has been historically stewarded by the indigenous people of the Cherokee, Shawnee, and Yuchi people. And I say that because as we begin to talk about theologies of difference, we have to remember what we have inherited and, and, and the ways in which we have eclipsed uh, difference. And so I mentioned the land that I'm on uh, because that's important. We need to remember the native peoples. Um, I'm trained as a constructive philosophical theologian and philosophical ethicist. Uh, my field is in theology and ethics, and I, I tend to deal with ideas. Um, ideas that are in the ether, ideas that are in culture, ideas that are in the church. Uh, and the, the ways that I do my work is that I think about how difference can uh, become manifest in, in our places of worship, in our places of culture and in our bodies. It might be helpful for me to define difference because you might have uh, a pre-existing idea of what difference is. Difference, uh, in contrast to the ways in which we think about it, this is different than that, a kind of oppositional thinking. Difference is actually that thing that is without a norm. So this is derived from philosophy, and when you begin to think about theology and difference, or theologies of difference, a sort of generative place, um, how do we think about a theology without a norm? Now, this is probably uh, new and perhaps even scandalous, uh, but, but I think even we can look at the person of Jesus as a person of difference. A person who disrupted the status quo, a person who destabilized norms and values and actually took values and revolutionized them through things like uh, flipping the table at the temple, uh, feeding of the 5,000, uh, raising the dead. We're not going to get into whether or not we believe in miracles, but these stories shape us and these stories help us embody a politics of what I call radical difference. Radical here means grasping for the root. So we're looking at what is the root of difference. Now, in my work, um, I launched my academic scholarship as a collaborative project, which is called the Activist Theology Project. And we work for social healing. We work to kind of uh, imbue difference into culture in a way that is hospitable. Uh, we try to destabilize oppositional thinking. Remember, this is different than that. That's a kind of oppositional thinking. And what we do is we work to destabilize that so that we can uh, bring alongside this politics of radical difference, a theology of difference, an ethics of difference, particularly around sexual difference, racial difference, ethnic difference, cultural difference. Because what I have seen is that our theologies really, um, they exacerbate supremacy culture. Our, our theologies that we've inherited have caused us to think in singular terms. Uh, our theologies that we've inherited have caused us to flatten out our differences. The theologies and ethics that we've inherited, and let me say that all theologies and ethics, right? What we believe shows up in how we live our lives, or what we practice. So the example that I always give is, where do we buy our coffee? What do we believe about our coffee? And perhaps for y'all in England, it would be tea. Where do we buy our tea? Do we buy our tea at a corporate conglomerate? So the 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 corporate conglomerate conglomerate here in in the states for coffee would be someplace like Starbucks or Caribou Coffee. What would I don't know what the equivalent would be in England for a tea conglomerate, a corporate conglomerate, but are we 
are we going to these corporate conglomerates for our for what is commodified or are we sourcing it from a local place i like to buy my coffee from a community source agriculture program out in california that pays farmers uh, a living wage and they're actually part owner of the company and so it's a really flat approach Every, everything is equally distributed um, and people are able to flourish and so why i bring that up is is the ways in which we flatten out differences it impacts flourishing and so i can just think about myself as a transgender latinx as a queer person that we try to flatten out the differences of sexual difference and and when we do that we we bridge together norms and values in a way that um that silences people that um puts people into a box that categorizes people and that stabilizes people and this i think can be really harmful especially when we do these things in the church where we expect people to conform and assimilate uh and so forth so difference the politics of radical difference is actually an effort uh to resist uh categories to resist norms but not resist values because we all have values values are tied to practices and we all have practices and so when I think about theologies of difference, I am already and always thinking about how do we how do we disrupt our inherited beliefs and how do we imagine another possible world? I know here in the States, we are really struggling with racial difference. Um, things like white supremacy, something that I call supremacy culture, has really taken hold of us and and the talons of supremacy culture are deeply embedded in our cultural body and in each one of our bodies. And I can imagine that there in England, there are economic supremacies, uh, there are racial supremacies, and there are other kinds of supremacy cultures uh, that are that are deeply embedded in, in the cultural body, in the collective body, in the church body, and in the individual body. And so how theologies of difference can come alongside and, and, and aid in healing and aid in helping us get free, I, I think a lot about freedom and liberation, is theologies of difference uh, takes uh, our practices very seriously and takes time to actually um, figure out what is the difference we are after. Is the difference we are after oppositional, in which case would accelerate harm? Or is the difference we are after a kind of reimagining our value system, reimagining our ethical practices? I like to tend to the latter, as you can imagine. And so theologies of difference can, can help reformulate our imagination along the side of uh, practices that then reshape our cultural imagination, our collective imagination, and our individual imagination. I remember years ago that my academic partner, Dr. Nikki Young, who's a black queer ethicist, said to me, I was putting books away in my shelf when I was living in Colorado as I was finishing my PhD. And she said to me this, imagination is the best thing we have on our side. And I have internalized that and it has become the thing that really animates uh, my thinking around difference. Difference and theologies of difference uh, are primarily about imagination. And our inherited beliefs, our inherited thought, our inherited theologies, those things that we have internalized from a baby onward, um, lack imagination. They lack the awareness of what we can imagine to be another possible world. And now let me just say, and let me give credit to that phrase, another possible world. I, that's not from me. That's actually from the Zapatistas in Chiapas, Mexico, where they strategically align themselves um, as a different community, as a community that sought to uh, disentangle themselves 
from the global north and from the economic supremacy of capitalism. That, I think, is an ethics of difference. And so they live together in community. They opt out of economic supremacy. They are no longer encumbered by global capitalism. Things like little things like this show up as ethics of difference. So I mentioned them because I borrow their phrase, another possible world, because at the core of their practice of difference is imagination. And so we have to think very carefully, what is the world we are after? What is the theology that we are after? And if it is a theology of difference, then perhaps could another possible world be achieved? I think so. Uh, again, it is bringing heaven to earth. And if we think about heaven as being the politics of radical difference, that, that other alternative world, that is the thing that we are chasing. That is the imagination after which we should run. So uh, theologies of difference is, is for a lot of people a, a very scary thing because we don't want to disrupt the status quo, right? We don't want to give up our privileges. We don't want to give up the things that make us comfortable, the, the things that are commodities, the, the things that are easy to access. But when we continue to um, live a life that accelerates uh, convenience, uh, we, can, we can see how that causes harm. And, and in a world that, that embodies accelerated harm, um, my sense is we need to do harm reduction. And so harm reduction really is wrapped up in theologies of difference. Because what it does is it creates conditions for a multiplicity of voices. Uh, we can think about theologies, how it's singular focused, how there is a, a static norm. And, and that static norm doesn't create conditions for the multiplicity of voices or a polyvocal theology, meaning many voices. And so... When I think about this, you know, Christianity has had a long history of uh, colonization, uh, about flattening out differences. And so how do we actually create conditions for a multiplicity, a robust democratic voice where every voice has say? That's really a theology uh, of difference that, that I think that we could... Um, pay attention to and, and lean into. Uh, now, of course, this is anxiety producing for a lot of cultures, uh, anxiety producing for a lot of churches, because we don't want to disrupt what's already working. But I have to ask you, is it really working? Uh, I just spoke at a church yesterday for Pride Sunday. We, we had our Pride later because of the pandemic and everything. And, and what I said was, um, if pastors want to create conditions for a livable life, then we need to think through sexual difference. This, again, would be a theology and ethics of difference. And I would say to you, if we want to create conditions for more flourishing, for a greater livability, then we have to think about our practices. We have to think about our theologies, right? Because every theology is wrapped up in a particular practice. The Eucharist is wrapped up in a, in a theology and a practice. Baptism is wrapped up in a theology and a practice. Uh, death and burial is wrapped up in a theology and a practice. And so what are, what are the theologies and what are the ethics that we need to reconfigure through the lens of imagination so that we privilege this ethics of difference? Now, of course, we're going to have some time together uh, for Q&A, and I would love to talk with you about this, but let me tell you one more story. After the 2016 election here in the United States, which the global audience was watching, I know that y'all are familiar with what happened in 2016, I ended up leaving my faculty post in Berkeley, California. Now, if you don't know anything about the United States, one thing that you should know is that the Bay Area of California is a bit like queer utopia. LGBTQIA persons flocked there uh, many years ago and created a sort of safe haven. 
but I found myself really lonely there. I didn't find my people. I found a lot of difference, uh, but, but the difference there was sort of um, lobbed together with the sort of sameness. And so I found that the difference that I encountered was a kind of oppositional difference. Gays were different than lesbians. It was this other than that, this different than that. Uh, I didn't really find queer people who, res who were resisting the norm. And what I'm really interested in, in my academic work, um, in my, in my um, clergy work, is to resist the norm. Uh, I like to say resist the bullshit, which is a theological term, I, I say. Um, and so I ended up leaving my faculty post. I left what many people call queer utopia, and I moved home to the American South. And I found a home here in Nashville, Tennessee. And I did that because I felt as though there was a chance for me to imagine a life of difference here in the American South than there was in the Bay Area of California, which everyone calls queer utopia. I mentioned that story because sometimes uh, our imaginative life, sometimes what we're convicted about, sometimes what we're compelled to do is to uh, relocate in time and space. Now, I'm not saying you need to pick up and move, but what I am saying is I had to consider uh, where I was living. I had to consider, am I capitulating to the bullshit? Am I assimilating into norms and values that actually run contrary to my ethics? And the answer was I was. And so I needed to shift my practice so that I could live into a life of difference and really accelerate imagination on a collective scale. So I moved home to the American South and made my home here, launched my scholarship, my academic scholarship as a collaborative project. And I, I work with a group of people to imagine another possible world. And we are convening people on our app and really trying to practice this theologies of difference in community, because that's the other thing. Theologies of difference um, has to be located in community. Theologies of difference aren't just imaginary. They aren't just floating around in time and space. They are tangible practices that happen in relationship. And so when we think about difference, that, that old definition, this is different than that, that is not located in relationship. Right? Oppositional politics is not fostering interpersonal relationships. But when we think about destabilizing norms, when we think about um, trying to imagine another possible world, that's all happening in relationship. And that work, that work will bring heaven uh, to earth, I think. So I'm really looking forward to talking with y'all later. I'm really looking forward to being in conversation. Really, conversation is where we can hash out a lot of these details. Again, I'm Dr. Robin Henderson Espinosa, uh, based in Nashville, Tennessee. Really looking forward to being together with you in Leeds. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk about theologies of difference. I can't wait for our conversation. Thank you very much, Professor Elizabeth, Dr. Robin. Thank you very much indeed uh, for what you've given us today. And thank you to all those who have joined uh, this event online. We're going to have um, a question and answer session beginning at half past three. So please join us with your questions then. Thank you.